often suggests were almost certainly Norwegian Vikings and landed in the Isle of Axholm. We have records in the Isle of Axholm uh, for the 14th century in a solid line from me right back to 1530. So no stranger to these parts. And my dad actually, after the Second World War, worked for about a year at Bartman Humber Secondary School, but when retreated back to farming when his dad said, you take over the farm. And then moved across the river to home on Spalding Moor. So um, my father was actually a Humberside County Councillor, so I feel kind of uh, connected very greatly to this wonderful estuary, uh, even though I now live a bit further away in Cottingham. And paradoxically, my recent archaeological work has been on the walls rather than the wetland areas, but my archaeological roots are very much within this region. Uh, I was quite pleased with that photograph. I do a lot of aerial photography as well. So uh, that was a flight last year. You can get this thing to work. Which, which bit do you press? Uh, there we go. Just the centre. Just bit, on the side. Yeah. Okay, the Humber. Well, one of the things I'm going to talk about today is how the enormous changes that take place through time to this estuary that many people don't really appreciate. I'll obviously concentrate on this, but do note these large areas of wetland which are now farmed in the whole valley, and particularly this area. Uh, found this as it's spelt on the map, but Funa as it should be called, I know, because I lived there for 20 years, and it was the bottom of our farm, our home on Spalding Moor. Hazo, where my father farmed, is just here. So this area has been the scope of my research for many, many years and was the focus of my PhD, which covered a landscape block basically from Brough to Herget and down across here, taking the whole catchment of the Funa Valley with some quite interesting results which are very pertinent to us today. We can get this thing to work. Yeah, I'll press on the slide. Um, there we go. So, we all know where the Humber is, obviously, and this map really is the focus, again, on the Walling Fen, which as time went on, changed from wetland to dryland to wetland to dryland. So, through time, major changes. I chose this particular area <coughs> with the catchment of the Funa for a number of reasons. I wanted to contrast the human activity on the walls up here with the lowlands of the Humber region. That photograph, in fact, is very telling because just in that image, you can see the whole history of reclamation. The curved field boundaries showing the progressive attempts to drain the Walling Fen and turn it into agricultural land. And of course, we now faced with this conflict about do we wet it to allow sea level change to happen? So it's been a constant battle between what to do with this wetland, important wetland area. Well, I'm going to go back possibly before the River Humber. And this is research I did with David Bridgeland uh, and Jim Innes at the University of Durham. And it all started when they got a phone call one morning from a gamekeeper on the Houghton Hall estate at Hobham Cars. Peter, I found a dinosaur tooth. It's not where you expect half past seven in the morning when you've got old bed to answer the telephone. Anyway, I took my wife and kids to see my old mate Tim. And we went on an elephant hunt, would you believe? Because it wasn't a dinosaur, it was actually the tooth of a straight tusked elephant. Straight tusked elephants were around, uh, prob this one's probably about uh, 240,000 uh, years ago, in a very different climate, much, much warmer, and putting together through the back pages of the Oxford Geological Society records looking through whole museums, I was actually able to reconstruct this ancient river system. And at um, Beals Beck, a famous site discovered in 1829, with some very interesting nature in it, 
which range from animals from a hot climate through to the Ice Age with uh, mammoth and uh, things in the same river valley, we worked out there was this huge river system. We caught down at Beals Beck and got nine metres of alluvial deposit. So it was one whacking great big river going north-south. The Triassic Mercy Mudstone in Lyre, um, use a geological term of Home Hill up here, is very, very interesting because David Bridgeland spotted Trent gravels on the top of it, which suggests that this is actually a northern branch of the River Trent, and therefore probably as old, if not older, than the crossing, the cut through that we're all familiar with. Even more exciting, and this talk is going to be about human landscape interaction, was evidence of very early humans. A metal detectorist called Mr. Foster found this over the crosses overlooking this great river. It was looked at by a famous um, prehistorian called Derek Rowe, professor at Oxford, and it's called an Ashleyan pointed hand axe used and probably dropped on the hilltop by an early Neanderthal or even earlier Homo heidelbergensis. No, not even our species directly. About the same era as the elephant. Very, very different and ancient landscape. And uh, the big quarries here uh, actually cut through uh, the South Cave and North Cave quarries, getting the gravels actually cut through that riverbed, sadly with very little work and a huge missed opportunity to look at some of this very ancient fauna, which is probably hunted in the same way as down at Boxgrove on the south coast and Haysborough off the uh, Suffolk or Norfolk coast. So we were able to put together this a wonderful map, which you can see, uh, which shows uh, the changing system. I think, can I go one back? I think yeah. I missed one. Uh, let's see. Um, there we go. Yeah. Um, I was at a meeting at Alpine Spalding Moor. Uh, couldn't go. The next meeting, uh, somebody said, oh, they found a bit of wood in, in a pit that we're digging. It wasn't wood at all. It's part of a mammoth femur. This reinforcing how that same river system is still there, but used very differently by nature from a hot to a warm climate. So at the top we've got Strectus elephants 240,000 years ago, and we've got mammoths, uh, obviously much more recently than the Dibenzian period of the last ice age. But uh, one of my colleagues that worked with this wonderful map showing the different animal species that once lurked along this proto funa River. Uh, I've seen possibly, which you may have seen, 240,000 years ago around Homont's Building Moor, North and South Cliff, rather bizarre, uh, with Strectus elephants being hunted. Um, just a reminder, if you put a Neanderthal in a suit, it's not that much different to what we are. Anyway, we move on rapidly. We've gone through the worst bits of the Ice Ages into what people have called an, e an Eden-like time. Suddenly the climate warms up uh, after the last big Ice Age, about 12,000 years ago, and it's left a lot of sand dunes around the edges of Home Hill and glacial lake, uh, lake deposits of the former glacial Lake Humber which you can see here. And the beginnings of the River Funa, which is a series of, of uh, shallow lakes, the name Sea, which you will see in a lot of these places, like Woolsey, Bursey, refers to areas of once water, Sea and Ross, is around Everingham Cars, once an area of wetland. And these places, as you can see from the dots on the map, are occupied by hunter-gatherers our own species, of course, uh, from about 10,000 BC onwards. And some of the finds that made these early hand axes 
uh, all purpose tools really for digging roots, even chopping trees. We know from Star Car up near Scarborough that these things could easily make nice platforms for launching canoes from, etc. Uh, Microliths for the later Mesolithic period. These tiny little flints put into <coughs> bits of wood to make arrows, spears, uh, laces for fishing eels and things like that. Um, and uh, working with uh, David Bridgeland in the red shirt there, we're doing a lot of coring along the river system. And there's a particular really interesting site, which is virtually destroyed sadly, one of three sand hills sticking out of this uh, marshland area of Everingham Cars, which have been used for hunting activities right through from the early Mesolithic to the first farmers from the same site. And surprisingly on this agricultural land, we've still got quite an amount of peat left to do the paleo-environmental reconstruction from. One of the really topical things I talk about at the moment to many groups is sea level rise. Um, and the Humble Wetlands group, who started in Hull University in the 1990s, did a lot of work coring across the Walling Fen here, showing the effect of sea level rise. You'll notice here the dark blue, this is the Soil Survey of England mapping, and the light blue. Those are uh, the result of two periods of marine transgression. And then at the top over here, in this stretch, Anna Coles, uh, as an undergraduate at Durham University with, with Dr. Innes, did all the coring, which you can see on the map on the left-hand side. The results are really <coughs> relevant to today. Brackish deposits, obviously this <coughs> tidal humber coming right up here. That's Home Hill, that's Market Wheaton. You can see its extent is over here. And although minus 2 to minus 2.2 OD is lower than present sea level, in terms of the period, it's very high. And we're looking here at the Sturiga landslip of Norway, which creates massive sea level rise, which covers Doggerbank and creates Britain into an island. And its effect is felt far upstream here at Market Wheaton. We've got this ancient tree in pretty good condition. We've got a nice radiocarbon date on it. And within the layers of peat, evidence of a dog and deer. So whether the dog walkers are a problem in the Mesolithic, I'm not sure. Anyway, it shows the effective transgression, transgression very far upstream. So this is a looking at the stretch of the Foon and the Markiewicz Canal on the right hand side. And this effect of the marine transgression that we're looking at down here with these layers of clay and it creates something like this and an explanation for the distribution of the uh, polished stone axes of the Neolithic they're not hand axes the sophisticated tools set in wooden handles around the head of that estuary at tidal inlet what is remarkable is where those things come from. Also, the other major change in DNA analysis has proven these are new people coming in from the continent. Um, we've got the first major monuments up here at Marker Wheaton World. That uh, light coloured splodge in the top is a long barrow where the excarnated bones of people were collected together, put into chambers as a burial monument. But around that, we've got lots of evidence of woodland, and most of those axes were used for managing woodland to build monuments like that because we know that quite a lot of the place <coughs> remained wooded. Hunting continued into the uh, Neolithic. People didn't just stop hunting. And this is a nice leaf arrowhead found near Marker Wheaton. These axes are remarkable. We've got flint from the Yorkshire Worlds. This is an adze, which was used for chopping... Uh, wood or was it it's got one bit of damage but other than that's perfect 
this absolutely perfect flint axe, a world's flint from uh, Everingham Cars area. And remarkably, this axe is from Northumberland. We've got other ones from Wales as well. As you can see here, the group axes, Group 6, Greater Lang Great Langdown, the Lake District. Group 7, Cry Cluid from North Wales. And this from the Great Wind Sill in Northumberland. First farmers, evidence for those around Southcliffe Common, a quern for grinding cereals, used for polishing polished stone axes. That's what this groove is from. Scrapers for scraping animal skins, preparing leather and things like that. And the top end of a sickle, obviously for harvesting. More evidence, pottery was introduced obviously by the first farmers. More sedentary lifestyle, hunter-gatherers didn't need pottery. And we've got some very sophisticated grooved work pottery which got, covers Britain in the late Neolithic. Um, and we found some of this at Hayton. More evidence for early farming, hazelnuts, animal bone in one of these pits which probably had ritual aspects. Moving on quickly, we've got a marine regression. Climate improves, sea levels drop, and the Walling Fen becomes a massive woodland. We talked about the Cleethorpes Beach Ancient Forest. Well, there's one here as well, which ran right the way up here. Oops, why has it gone backwards? Yeah. Uh, Different cultures as well, different burial monuments, Mark of Wheaton World, if you've travelled between York and Hull, you'd have gone straight through this cemetery of round barrows. Again, complete uh, migration, evidence of migration. And the word evidence for the woodlands of this area being occupied by a massive red deer, like this one. Uh, when this was discovered, it was actually in, in uh, the mouth of a dog. I went to visit a farmer and this Labrador was running around with this set of antlers in its mouth. It looked quite comical. But it is very large and it came from the Bronze Age woodland. Exploited by different types of tools, these rather sophisticated axe heads that you can see of uh, copper alloy. And of course, those are used to make the famous Ferroby boats. The detail on some of the planks actually were able to identify exactly the type of bronze axe that was used. Ted Wright, who I had the great pleasure to meet, uh, started working in, just before the Second World War with his brother, beachcombing along the Humber and found the famous boats. The earliest planked boats in Europe. Why on earth don't you make more fuss of them? We've got worldwide important archaeology here. <clears throat> All right, okay. I'm not used to this uh, new for. Uh, right, yeah, evidence for this Bronze Age uh, forest. Um, in 1984, we saw six of these huge oak trees which had been felled by the next phase of landscape change, which is a massive marine transgression, which goes right up into this area here, right along the Foon Valley. And you can see in that top one, I hope there's no health and safety people here. We did have hard hats, but they were a mile away in the Land Rover before we got down here. We should really have gone back. See the change there? Late Mesolithic, clays, Bronze Age forests, Iron Age, uh, marine transgression, very, very sudden and very like this, which we all remember from 2013. We're heading for that again, I'm afraid. I suppose the most famous discovery I'll ever make uh, was the Hazard log boat, which is now looking more like a raft in Hull Museum but rather spectacular, Britain's largest surviving log boat. Found on a farm where I was actually brought up, and I was able, some years after my father had left the farm, to look, find this in a very early part of a major archaeological project. 
Uh, it's enormous, 12 and a half metres long, 322 to 277 BC. The tree was 800 years old and part of that huge Bronze Age forest. There it is, how it once looked. It doesn't look like that anymore, sadly, but there we go. Uh, it was carrying interesting things like cattle and red deer bones and evidence for this butchery, a pole axe. Uh, straight through the head of this uh, cow. And putting all the evidence together from the paleo environment and the archaeology and the air photography, looking at the crop marks showing ancient sites, this is the kind of thing that we get, this ancient landscape. One of the things that occurs naturally in the area from the industrial point of view is a bane of the life of farmers. It's bog iron ore, which accumulates naturally as uh, the soil leaches through and iron goes from the sandy soils and is trapped by the underlying clays and forms an iron pan. And this was used extensively around Hormons Balding Moor for the Britain's third biggest iron industry in the Iron Age. And this was Britain's largest slag heap you think of West Yorkshire first like in South Yorkshire slag heaps. Well, here he is, Homer Spalding Moor, me taking the wheelbarrow at the back. And this is my second most important discovery. Gradient carbon dates fit nicely with the Haslam log boat. Uh, in terms of nature, we estimate 47 hectares of woodland is used to produce the charcoal for, for making that. And uh, produce quite a lot of iron to make these things which are also contemporary. The chariot barrels that we've all heard about, thanks to Pocklington, uh, needed a lot of iron. And um, here we are, not far from Stonethorpe, I suppose. Um, interesting statistics here. 36 kilos of iron needed for all the chariot fittings and the iron for a chariot was 20, uh, 288 person days using the methodology that was available to them at the time using furnaces like this not electrically blown of course like Peter Crew's very very important experiments but hand blown and there's one of the iron tires well we've all heard about these in the news and I'm very lucky to be an academic advisor on the chariot burials from Pocklington which appeared on telly fairly recently Remarkable with the two horses actually buried in the grave as if pulling the chariot. Here's the one at Burnby Lane. Pocket is greedy. Not only has he got a unique burial with two horses in it, it's got two burials with two horses. These are the dismantled chariot, those intact. And also this thing, most important Iron Age shield ever found in Britain, which is found underneath this chap here. Which hopefully, if all goes well, we'll see in a new museum at Burnley Hall, Pocklington. Iron industry very closely associated with this estuary, clustered around here, starting really where the estuarine tidal incursions finish on this reach. This is really quite interesting. But we've got others at the whole valley as well. The dots show the distribution of the chariot burials. So there are two boats, uh, one at Southcar Farm, which ended up in a farmer's pond because he didn't want any bloody archaeologists here. And the, however, the people doing the drainage had a guilty conscience and took this photograph before it was pulled out in chains and dumped. It was in fact bigger than the Hazard boat, but very, very important its location. It's near North Cay where there's more iron working. But that is what the sea level rise, the effect of sea level rise in the Iron Age would be on the landscape that you're all interested in. Very, very different. Great stretches of open water and marshland with reed swamps and all the rest of it. Lots of activity. These are the burials, the famous square barrows which come through. Possibly another incursion of people in the Iron Age. And the nearest parallel in around France and Belgium, the Ardennes and Paris. The Humber was also a conduit for big change in this area from the south. 
when contact with Rome was made. We've got the first coins coming into the region from Lincolnshire and Leicestershire, the Coriol Tauvi, who the tribe who lived here. And we've got Wheel from Pottery coming into the East Riding for the first time uh, through the Red Cliff at Ferriby. And also the earliest Roman imports into the region as well. Close by at South Cave, evidence for contact between native and incoming Romans, a weapons cache of 33 iron spear tips and five superbly decorated swords, but buried under an olive oil jar, uh, which the standard Roman practice. Possibly a weapons cache to resist the Romans, or else the last kind of ritual deposit, uh, saying that the old warrior cultures were dead and Rome was in control. But these swords, which can go freely and see in, in the treasure house in Beverly, are absolutely remarkable and of world importance. Perhaps somebody who made the middle one was walking on the Humber foreshore, saw a bit of sperm whale and said, oh, that bone's interesting. We'll use it for making the sword uh, handle. We've also got uh, ivory from elephants as well. These are not stupid people. Look at the artwork. The Romans arrive in the north, probably about 70. They've been in Lincoln from about 60. There's a lot of Roman activity in this area and they cross the brook and have this iron ring of forts on the dividing line between the territory of the Parisi in East Yorkshire and the Brigantes of West Yorkshire. Uh, all the spots show where early Roman coins have been found and we've got the tombstone of one of the early soldiers who crossed in the 9th Legion. A Gaul by birth, uh, he dies in York age 28. And that's a picture of a Roman cavalryman based on finds from Malton. Evidence for the forts, you can see at Hayton in the Grand Crop. I took this photograph in 1995 in a dry year. Bruff has a fort as well. And my current research is based on this field here. And if uh, Historic England play the game and give me a license to excavate, we've got some very exciting archaeology, which I'll show you now. This is ground penetrating radar. We go from a football field through a load of rubble to reveal a Roman town. With all those buildings, the defences, I'm running through again, this structure here, and lots and lots of buildings filling that playing field. So a major Humber port in the Roman period. That blodgy stuff is the limestone and sand they put on when they level the playing field. See the defences coming through and a road with other roads and this structure here which is very, very interesting indeed as we'll see in a moment because here and here we think we've got the lost theatre at Bruff, which goes with a famous inscription, and they hope to dig that this year. The Humber was very different shape. Where Bruffhaven is now was on the edge <coughs> of this Walling Fen Inlet, which is still there in the Roman times, and why Bruff was there. From just this archaeological site here, look there by Peter Armstrong in 1977, there are 80 boxes this big of Roman pottery. Huge site. More evidence for the use of the Humber for trade. Lead pigs from Derbyshire, from the lead silver mines, uh, from Lutadarum, which is the place uh, along down the Trent and onto the moors in Derbyshire where lead was extracted, uh, was piled into ships and sailed up the Trent, out of the Humber, and we've got evidence for it going all over the Roman world. Fat sweet, we've got evidence of salt manufacture as well. Mm -hmm and lots of evidence for trade. Who was doing this? We've got good evidence from various places. This is a remarkable uh, Bordeaux altar to mother goddesses and it was set up by this chap, Marcus Aurelius Lunaris. And he was a priest of the imperial cult 
and he was from York and Lincoln. The very words Linden, Colonia and Ibarakum are on that inscription and it was found in the medieval walls of Bordeaux. So fantastic evidence for trade. No doubt he got a good deal on the wine and, and a tricky journey so he set that up in Fangs. This is fascinating. Attached to the Sixth Legion in York was a river pilot. His job was to go up and down the Humber, just like the pilots do today. And again, he says to the African, Italian, Gallic mother goddesses, Marcus Minucius Audens, soldier of the Sixth Legion Victrix and a pilot of the Sixth Legion, willingly, gladly, and deservedly fulfilled his vow. So he's saying thank you for a safe trip down the Ouse, up the Humber, and to elsewhere. The Humber's important as well in the Roman period for trade. Remember, York appears an imperial city. Two Roman emperors actually die in York. Uh, the little houses mark Roman villas. The road system is dictated by the wetland area. The 1079 more or less running parallel to the road and over it in some places. And we've got this massive pottery industry which kind of replaces the iron industry in Helmond Spalding Moor. Some wealth in the region at Brantingham, just off the Humber. We've got this amazing mosaic, part of which is in Hull Museum. And how I got interested in archaeology, these training archaeological sites excavated three of these on my dad's farm at Helmond Spalding Moor when I was a schoolboy. And the next star farm produced this other pottery kiln. 34 kiln sites within an 8 by 8 kilometre area of Home on Spalding Moor. And back to nature, evidence for carbonised wood, and we're able to work out the species that they'd used for firing this industry. And proved that woodland was maintained and properly managed along the Funa watercourses. I thought you'd particularly like this fossilised nature. To make the pottery go grey, they had to seal it off. And they did this by going down to the river, getting a great goop of clay and wetland vegetation and sealing it. So the pottery went grey as the fire used up all the oxygen. In it, not only you've got the thumbprints and handprints of the potter, but you've also got all these little stripy bits, which I'm assured by my botanist friends are wetland plants. But we've also got this, this wonderful fossilised animal footprint on a brick about this size, which are on the pottery kiln supports within one of those kilns. So what happens? Bruff becomes a naval base, not a bit like this possibly, this is Port Chester. Uh, we hope to do more investigation. We know from the 30s excavation that have massive defences on one side here. Manned by soldiers that look very different from the traditional picture of Roman soldiers that you see in most films. Far much more like the Bayer Tapestry than Trajan's Column, for example. And this is a wonderful group of reenactors. Evidence for naval base, possibly two usurper emperors. Alexis and Carousius probably had the base, but using the Humber Estuary as one of their major uh, ports. And there's Bruff in its location on the Humber. Okay, if anybody's interested in looking at the Iron Age in particular, we've got a launch event for a new book that I've just produced uh, talking about the chariot burials. Paul Aware and I are giving a double header uh, on the 25th of March, and you're all welcome to see that. So, thank you for listening. Uh, if there are any questions, I'd be very happy to answer them, and I hope I haven't gone on too long. <laughs>